just a nosy. All right, thanks for that. Uh, welcome to the uh, the May 25th, 2023 uh, meeting of the San Francisco uh, Creek uh, Joint Powers Authority. My name is Drew Combs. I am uh, the, the chair um, this year. And so when we're calling to order the meeting at 3.38. Um, first agenda item is roll call. I, I see that uh, Director Pine uh, is here, is present. Director Stone is present. I'm uh, Director Combs present, and Director Eisenberg is present. Um, uh, Director Abrika is not present. Is not present, and there is uh, no no um, East Palo Alto alternate uh, pr present. Also, correct, correct. Okay. With that, we'll go to the second agenda item, which is approval of the agenda. Um, and so, uh, oh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so. Um, so I, I will, uh, then, uh, kick it to the, the, the JPA attorney to, uh, to, to add, uh, an item, uh, on the agenda. Hi, thank you. Um, we wanted to um, let everyone know that since publishing the agenda, it has come to our attention that it, there is one item that needs to be added to the agenda, which requires immediate action pursuant to government code section 59454.2B1. And that is for item 6B, um, conference with labor negotiator. Um, the board will need to designate a new labor negotiator since the current designated representative uh, board member Ruben Abrika is not available for this role and is also unable to attend today's meeting. So this item requires immediate action um, so that the labor negotiations can take place at today's closed session and for any direction given by the board to be included in the board's consideration of the proposed operating budget for the next fiscal year, which is item 7A on the agenda. So we propose that this item um, be added to the agenda after item five, which is guest presentation and before item six, closed session. So in order to add this item to, to the redesignation of the labor negotiator, the board must make a finding that this item has come to the JPA's attention subsequent to the agenda posting and that it requires immediate action. The board must vote to add the item to the agenda and such vote must be approved by at least two thirds of those present. So with four board members present, that means you have to have a vote of at least three members. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. All right, th thank you um, uh, for, for adding that item. And so I I'll move uh, that we we add an agenda item to select a labor negotiator. Um, and, and so this is, again, not a substantive discussion at this mm -hmm. moment about the item, just uh, a to vote add it. To, to, to add it. And so is, is there a second? Second. Okay, so um, I moved and Director Eisenberg seconded uh, the, the motion to add um, to the terms uh, stipulated by, by the JP attorney um, uh, an agenda item to select a labor negotiator. And so I will now uh, conduct a roll call vote. Uh, 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 Director Pine? Yes. Uh, uh, D uh, Director Stone? Yes. Uh, Director Combs, uh, yes to uh, Director Eisenberg? Yes. Okay, so then that, that motion passes. And so, and so now we get back to agenda item two, which is approval of, uh, of, of, of the agenda and open to any, any questions uh, or, or comments or, or a motion on that. Uh, Director Eisenberg. I, I, I move to approve the agenda as okay. amended. All right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll second. Um, and, so, and so then we'll, we'll go to roll call vote. Um, Director Pine. Yes. Uh, Director Stone. Yes. Director Combs is yes, and Director Eisenberg. Yes. Okay, cool. So then, um, the uh, agenda, as amended, is 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 approved. Um, now we'll move on to approval of a meeting minutes from April twenty seventh, twenty twenty three, which was a regular board meeting. Are there any uh, comments or questions um, or, or motions on on that uh, that item? Uh, uh, Director Eisenberg. I move to approve the minutes. 
Okay, we have a motion to approve uh, the minutes, the meeting minutes from April 27th. Second. All right, and we have a second from uh, Director Stone. Uh, and so now we'll, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Director Pine? Yes. Director Stone? Yes. Uh, Dir Director Combs is also a yes. And Director Eisenberg? Yes. All right, we have approved the uh, meeting minutes from April 27, 2023. And with that, we'll go on to public comment. Um, under public comment, individuals may speak on non-agendized topics for up to uh, three minutes. I have one uh, public comment card from Mark Weiss. And so Mr. Weiss uh, can um, provide a, a public comment. Good afternoon. Uh, board and uh, thank you for your service and for your leadership on these important and often complex issues. My name is Mark Weiss. I live in Palo Alto. I have lived in this region for since 1968. Um, and um, I saw an item in the local paper and it was also referenced in the social media feed of Valley Water the other day about um, the Super Bowl coming back to the region in uh, 2026. In two years, it'll be in Santa Clara, although of course uh, it's now named after the host is the San Francisco 49ers, but as we know, they're actually South Bay now these days. And I think it's an opportunity to um, for the environmental community to do something in conjunction with the Super Bowl because the eyes of the world and sports fans and many other types uh, will be watching us. And uh, so I don't have any specific proposals, and, uh, but I'm wondering uh, what the environmental community can do to use the occasion of the Super Bowl to uh, raise um, questions or provide uh, education about um, water and land and air and um, issues like that that are essential to what you are obviously going to be work on today. Um, I actually have a concert company called Earthwise Productions, not to promote myself, but um, I, um, I think perhaps music could be used uh, to teach about um, water issues and land use issues. Um, my company is actually a spinoff of Bay Area Action, which uh, produced Earth Day activities here at Stanford in Palo Alto in um, 1990 and 1992. Peter Dreckmeyer, who later served in leadership here and also is still involved in water issues, uh, that's where I met him. And uh, again, I don't have a specific proposal, but I'm hoping that uh, the environmental community and perhaps you as leaders of nearby communities uh, could um, do something for the Super Bowl that would make people um, appreciate uh, our natural resources and all the work that people like you do on these issues. So thanks a lot. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weiss, for the comment. Um, I don't have any other public comment cards, but if, if there is any one um, either uh, joining remotely or, or in chambers who would like to provide public comment, they're more than welcome to. Okay, cool. All right, with that, we will move on um, from agenda item four, public comment, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, agenda item five, guest presentation. Um, Dr. Jeannie Suckle uh, of Stanford University will present a summary of her research paper, Increasing Equity and Flood Risk Mitigation Planning. <clears throat> Lessons from San Francisco Creek, uh, California. And so, um, with that, is she joining us remotely or? It was uh, our understanding that she would be here, but she's, she's not, okay. so. Okay, well, that, that's totally, uh, to, totally cool. Is this her? Is, is that her? Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm so sorry. You're replacing at 3.30 or 4? That's 2.30 or 2.30 time, so it's yeah Hmm. 
Okay, for those joining at, at home, just give us a minute and we'll, we'll bring up the presentation. Sorry. I, I was, some people are joining remotely and so I was just making an announcement about. Uh, are, are, are we, are you Jenny Suckle? No, okay. All right, so no. <laughs> Emily, so, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah so. No, so you're, you're, you're definitely not in the right place. <laughs> Sorry, no worries. But if you see Jen Hassel, that's what Oh, you here for the for the Caltrain? The Caltrain? No, I'm here for direct his name about our property and our bank's construction and stuff. So that might be in the conference. Let me show you why. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Council members don't. No worries. Thanks. And then if you see our speaker, send her. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. There's definitely a lot going on. We almost yeah. had a different presentation. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> About a, a, a use permit. <laughs> for... We would have ha handled it, I'm sure. Yeah. No. I'm glad this building is being used to its um, yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> okay. I will. So, uh, I, I, um, yeah, I please, just... please go, Kevin Murray. <laughs> we're, we're trying to contact our presenter now. So. Should the board wish to uh, move agenda items around, you can certainly do so. Okay, so we will certainly, um, uh, I don't know if it's like continue or pause that agenda item uh, for, for the moment, we can't um, continue since um, uh, uh, she, she's not here to give the presentation. So, so I'd imagine we just go to agenda item six, which is, uh, oh, excuse me, now we will go to our, um, our new we uh, our new agenda item, which is selecting a labor nego go negotiator, um, but we're, we're going to maybe wait for, um, for we've Stone. Stone to return. <laughs> so we've we've lost Director Stone. So we'll, we'll wait a minute for him to to, to return before um, moving forward. Cool. All right. Uh, um, now that uh, uh, Director Stone has returned, we'll move on to um, what essentially is agenda item, uh, uh, like sort of, five yeah, 5.5, 5. That, that's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> because, um, and selecting a labor negotiator, um, I, I think the, uh, uh, you know, uh, JP attorney essentially pres provided the staff presentation on, on this item. And so I'll, I'll bring it to um, the dais before discussion and motion. And so a key, and if I can just add yeah, that, um, pursuant to, I believe it's the JPA agreement, um, the, the board has the authority to appoint either one or up to two labor negotiators. Um, so the board may wish to consider a, a team of two, if two are available, in case one is not available to make one of the future meetings. Okay, um, th that that sounds good to me. So yeah, I, I would be open. And I, I think um, the, the key is, uh, certainly going to be availability um, at the next uh, regularly scheduled JPA meeting. I, I know that I'm not available for for, for that that meeting. Um, uh, so, so, but but yeah, we'll we'll open it up for for uh, uh, director director Pine or 
or your, your light is, or is no, it just, okay. Uh, okay, all right, totally fair. I'm uh, sorry, Director Eisenberg. Yeah, I, I just want to volunteer. I'm available. Um, I have lots of free time and, um, and I am a, and I'm an employment lawyer and negotiator. Um, and I, you know, I think I, maybe because I don't have the history as long as other people, maybe that'll help me be that unbiased. Yeah. And I, and I welcome working in coordination with another, if the chair desires, whatever is best, but I, I'd be happy to take on this role on behalf of the JPA, knowing that I wouldn't be binding the JPA, but rather just negotiating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. So D director Eisenberg has, has volunteered. And so would um, any other uh, director also want to volunteer if, if we are looking for, for, for two names? Um, uh, is it? Anyone, anyone? You I'll, I'll be out of town on June 22nd. So I won't be able to attend that meeting. So I can't. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that day. Well, we want to make sure at least that one of yeah. the potential uh, negotiators are, are are available for for, for that the, the June regular meeting. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to volunteer. Okay. You, you, I'm, yeah, I think I'll pass on it. Oh, you'll, you'll pass. Okay, so <laughs> so then I'll I'll, I'll volunteer um, again. I'm not available, but but we have two, uh, and so and and so. But between uh, the two of us. Uh, uh, Director Eisenberg has said that that she um, she is certainly available for for the June meeting. Um, okay, and so with that, I'll make a can, do I make a motion that Director Eisenberg and and I uh, be appointed the labor negotiators? Yes. So we will need a motion for um, for a selection of the labor negotiator regarding the executive director position. All right. So uh, I'll move uh, along the lines uh, of the JPA attorney statement that um, we select uh, 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 two labor negotiators um, in connection with the executive director contract um, with the JPA and that those uh, labor negotiators be Director Eisenberg and Director Combs. And so I'll, I'll, I'll make that motion. A second. All right, so we have a first and a, and a second. Um, and so I'll do a roll call <clears throat> vote. Uh, Director Pine? Yes. Uh, Director Stone? Yes. Uh, D Director Combs? Yes. Uh, D Director Eisenberg? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, that, um, that uh, s settles that. Um, and so is the uh, guest speaker? Yes, present? our guest speaker has arrived. Okay, all right, cool. All right. all right, so then we will switch back up before going into closed session for uh, agenda item six. We'll switch back up to agenda item five, a guest presentation. Um, and it's uh, from Dr. Uh, Jenny Suckle. Please um, feel free to correct me if, if I butcher your, your name of Stanford University. And she will present a summary of her research paper, Increasing Equity in Flood Risk Mitigation Planning, uh, Lessons from San Francisco Creek, California. Thank you so much. Is that a perfect place to be? Yeah. yeah is the mic on? Yeah. Okay, now. So first of all, my apologies for being late. I went to the Menlo Park offices, but I feel like I've made it here in record time. So hopefully that at least partially makes up for it. I'm excited to be here. Um, this research project is unusual in the sense that it is not us from Stanford imposing or like deciding what's valuable to do research, but instead this has emerged from a scientific collaboration with the city of East Palo Alto. And a couple of years back, they raised concerns that um, the current infrastructure planning for San Francisco to Creek might not be as advantageous for them as a city as it might be for Palo Alto and Menlo Park. So we looked into that um, just to provide a quantitative view on this opinion. And so it's my pleasure to briefly summarize the main findings. I think you might find them interesting, both in terms of thinking about them from San Francisco to Creek, but also in terms of thinking about other urban rivers um, that we might have similar concerns about. Okay, sure. Would you advance them for me? Sure. Okay. So um, if you could sw switch to the next slide. Um, what we're interested in understanding is what I refer to as flood risk transfer. So what is that and why do I think it's important to talk about it? Whenever we make infrastructure updates upstream, so for example, in this case, if there's a widening of Pope Chaucer, that allows more water to pass through that bridge. And that means that the downstream communities from that bridge will have more water coming down their way. The question then becomes whether the creek can 
capture that amount of water or not. So that's in that sense, the infrastructure updates upstream do have important consequences for downstream communities. That's not new to the JPA. That's not new to most people who think about river dynamics. But what's important is to think about specifically how do we incorporate that general insight into planning. So here is a brief summary of the projects that we're talking about. There's the upstream project and the downstream project. And the downstream project is already implemented. The upstream project was sort of what we were debating. So if you could flip to the next slide. Let me briefly explain how our approach is different to the kinds of models you might have seen in existing reports. So the, this slide gives you a bit of an overview. The central piece here, which I refer to numerical modeling, is what you might be familiar with. So these are the kinds of models you would see in standard reports. They're called HEGRAS models. What they do is they take a certain amount of water input. They have detailed information about the geometry of the river, and then they compute where would I overrun the banks of that river. That's great. I think it's a wonderful model. I think we can use it in a variety of ways. I think one issue with it is that it, it's very, it takes one specific input and computes one specific output. One challenge when we think about risk is that we don't know what we will be dealing with, particularly in a world that has climate change. The influxes might vary quite a bit. The sea level rise is changing the river dynamics downstream. So what we're adding to this debate is what's shown here on the left. It's called statistics modeling, basically what we're trying to do is assess with the current information we have about climate, what is the range of potential floods that we should be thinking about. So the main shift in thinking that we're proposing is to think beyond one specific event. Yes, the planning is motivated by the record event that happened, um, but what will happen is not necessarily the same thing. So the floods that will come in the future are not necessarily the ones that were in the past. So how do we do the statistical modeling? One big challenge in thinking about climate change is the records are short. So we don't have enough information to say the return, a 100 year return period in modern climate looks like this because climate is changing as we speak. So that's the challenge. So what we're doing is we're creating 50 potential thin synthetic futures. So we're kind of creating basically an, I, an IA approach to this and we were kind of considering where we're, we're creating these 50 possible scenarios, all of them a thousand years long, informed by whatever data we have. So that is, if you could flip to the next slide, the main contribution of this, where we have basically the black cloud is um, what, our, what, um, what our simulation suggests might happen, the red is the data. So we're trying to create basically a statistical representation of what we see today, but we only see a small snapshot of that. And in particular, because climate is changing really rapidly, we have a very small snapshot of a process that is has lots of possibilities. So what we're doing here is we're both constraining the rainfall that would come into the river. So that's basically the input into the river and the, the bottom end of the river, which is sea level rise. So we have both of these components and that's an important addition to the current planning, which did a great job thinking about sea level rise, but was less um, deliberate in thinking about the inflows that will come into the river in a changing climate. And by changing climate, I mean really a modern climate as in today, not as in 50 years ago. So if you could switch to the next slide. So then we're using this statistical model to force the same HECRAS model that everybody uses. So this is the same model that you've seen in all of the reports. It's the model that everyone has agreed on. We're just kind of exploring if I have different forcings for this model, then what would be the floods that emerge from that? If you could switch to the next slide. Um, I think that's all right, just flip, switch forward. So the output of that is what you see here. So what you're seeing here is basically the water levels across San Francisco Creek. The little gray lines are all of the possibilities that we are identifying. And then the black line is the bank elevation. So whenever the little gray lines go over the little black line, that's when a flood would start at these locations. And we do this for all of our thousands and thousands of simulations. And what we find for that, if you could switch to the next slide. So the key um, insight from that is this is what it looks like right now. So this is what the model predicts right now. When you look at this map, think about it 
in a similar way as an epicenter map for earthquakes. So we're just showing where the flood starts. We're not necessarily showing where the water will go, right? Like, so this is just a question of where do the floods initiate. You can see right now that the, the blue dots, basically where the floods start is around Pope Chaucer Bridge. So the Pope Chaucer Bridge is indeed the main constriction to the river right now. So if we had large rainfalls, that is the most likely location where a flood would start. Now, if you could switch to the next slide, um, here is, um, so that's the Pope Chaucer location. In, in the next slide, if we make the infrastructure updates in the same way as they're planned right now, you can see that the blue dots in this red square disappear. So we no longer would see floods initiating around Pope Chaucer, which is amazing, right? Like that's great, that's what we're trying to do. But you also see little blue dots, slight blue dots emerging further downstream. And that's a consequence of Pope Chaucer being widened and more water passing downstream to specific locations where the creek cannot accommodate that amount of water. Now, these are relatively small, right? But this flooding occurs in communities that are less affluent um, than some of the ones upstream, which I think is an important context here. This kind of infrastructure update would be modified significantly by sediment release. Um, so if you could switch to the next slide. So here we're adding both so that's kind of the new, the new flood locations. If we add the effects of sediment that could be released from Searsville Dam as currently planned, the sediments would tend to accumulate in parts of the river that move relatively slowly. Relatively slowly tend to be areas where it's already constricted and where I already have this elevated flood risk. So the sedimentation would further increase this flood risk that we're concerned about. And if you can switch forward um, now, this is present day. This would be the effect of rainfall patterns evolving as they have in the last few decades. So um, you might follow this in the news, rainfall in California is becoming more variable. We have more dry phases, we have more wet phases. The math way of saying that would be that the variability increases. So what we're assuming here is that this trend continues as is. We're not actually assuming that it will get worse, which it might very well, but we don't know that for now, we're just saying if the trend increases, or like if this trend continues as it does right now, then this is the consequence of that. And what's important to keep in mind is that if this, this this increase in variability really changes the likelihood of floods emerging very significantly. So it's not necessarily a small change. In the data, we've seen about a 50% increase in variability since 1975. So that's the last few decades. And that would mean that the flooding that we're projecting for some of these communities in East Palo Alto would increase by a factor of three to five. So what does that mean in terms of return periods? If you could flip to the next slide. So for example, these small little blue dots that you looked at earlier, from a historic point of view, they would be relatively small. They would be a 300 year event, but with climate change, it could be a 77 year event. And for the other location, um, it would be a 36 year event. And so then it starts becoming more significant, right? So I think it's important, what, you know, what, what we think is important here is that, um, if we promise to plan for a 100 year event, which is often the ambition behind large infrastructure projects, then I think we need to be thoughtful about how long that promise is valid for. And this kind of analysis would suggest that even by the time we finish the project, it might no longer be valid because climate keeps changing and the impact of that on flood risk is very significant. So to summarize, um, I think the three main findings that we just want to pass on for your deliberation would be um, if we want to plan sustainably, then I think it's important to keep in mind that the flood risk in San Francisco to Creek is dominated by precipitation. So our model allows us to quantify exactly what drives flooding for San Francisco to Creek. For San Francisco to Creek, it is rainfall. Rainfall is the main driver, certainly in the upstream region. Near the bay, that's it's mostly sea level rise, but the sea level rise component has basically been solved, quote unquote, by the current planning of the downstream project. So that is no longer, I think, a big issue. So for sea level rise, I think we're good. My concern or the concerns of our team is related to the effect of precipitation on flood risk. So I think it's important to think about that. I think at the very least, we need to be transparent about what the risk reduction, what risk reduction we're achieving and for whom, right? Like who are the communities that are benefiting and who are the communities for whom risk might increase? I should say, keep in mind that because this flood risk is quote unquote new, 
these households would not necessarily have insurance. They would not necessarily have lived experiences of this kind of flooding happening before. The second point is this idea of like planning equitably in engineering and in environmental engineering. I'm a professor of geophysics and environmental engineering. We try to become more intentional about thinking about these equity implications. And I think this analysis can help us do that by disaggregating the total risk reduction into a spatially dependent risk reduction, like who experiences most of that risk reduction and who is experiencing a risk increase. So that's why we ask you to, to maybe take that into account Account. And then finally, planning adaptively. I mentioned this issue of sediment release. Um, from a modeling point of view, sediment release is one of those tricky problems that you can parameterize into a model in any number of ways, but I have to admit I trust none of them. So if you want my opinion on that, I, I think it would be really valuable to monitor the sediment release and accumulation rather than spend a lot of time modeling it. Just install instrumentation that monitors where that happens because that will have, could have anyways, in a significant impact on flood risk. Thank you. Cool, thank you very much for that, that presentation. Um, let's first open it up to public comment and then we'll bring it back to the dice. And I wouldn't do this because I forgot to call for public comment on on the prior agenda item. And so, so I'll, I'll um, uh, again, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for the presentation. I'll open this agenda item up uh, to call for public comment, um, and then we'll bring it back to the dais. And after we wrap this up, I will um, call for public comment on the uh, the the amended agenda item, uh, just so for for the record, so we can do that. And so, um, so yes. Does any member of the public wish to make a public comment at this time, online or in person? I have no request to speak at this time. Okay, cool. And I, I have no public comment cards. And so we'll bring it back to the dais for any comments or questions. Uh, Director Eisenberg. Um, thank you so much for this. I think it is extraordinarily helpful, really important. And I think very professionally done. I'm biased. My degree is out of Stanford, decision science. So a lot of statistics. And I think it's just great. And I'm hoping that your work can be incorporated into our work. Um, I'm new to the JPA, so I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I, I, um, I think it's really important. I know we all agree that environmental justice is an extremely important part of our mission. We don't want to move the risk from high income areas to low income areas. That is the opposite of what we're here for. So thank you for that. So my question is, um, and by the way, I am so grateful for your acknowledgement that we just don't know, you know, that, you know, the only thing that's constant is change. I love that. I mean, isn't that the truth? I mean, we really don't know. And that's just great to hear. And even modeling from 1975, I mean, how can that even? So anyway, I love the way you presented it and I'm really grateful. So my question is really about, um, you know, I think we all are really concerned about East Palo Alto. It has, you know, it faces, it, the, you know, it is lower income. So often it means we have uninsured, we can have multifamily housing, sometimes possibly with landlords that are not really possibly doing their best possible job at, at keeping the residents safe. I mean, there are, you know, corporate owned, you know, buildings that maybe also aren't, I have no idea. Um, so and so it's a lot of risk to the community that has already suffered a lot historically, you know, especially on behalf of by white, you know, from, you know, white majority Palo Alto. Just read the book Palo Alto, a history of capitalism, yada, yada. And I think it's great. Anyway, so not with it. The, so there's another problem, too. I'm wondering if you all have considered, you know, when it comes to East Palo Alto that has all these vulnerabilities, and that is the rising groundwater issue, too, because, you know, there's so much toxicity mm -hmm. in that groundwater or level of it in East Palo Alto. And that can be just really devastating, you know, for communities and for human beings, animals who live there. So has that been factored into your analysis? And what are your recommendations with that? Yeah, thank you for that. So I should say that um, our work and our initiative tries to identify risks more broadly. So we're not quote unquote, just doing the San Francisco Creek project, but we are in fact currently working on a four year long survey with marginalized households in East Palo Alto, 
um, several of the mobile home parks, North Fair Oaks and other communities to understand what are the challenges that they're facing. And the preliminary results from that are indeed surprising and sometimes jaw dropping in terms of the threats that they are experiencing. So for example, we have instrumented several of the households with indoor air quality sensor and we are noticing that the air quality is significantly elevated in low income households. Um, and also the air quality is comparable to a fire event um, for a significant portion of the year. So that is one of those insights. To yeah. the airport, I'm just curious, the leaded fuel or you don't know? So it's interesting, like we've tried every trick in the book of statistics to identify what is happening. There is no significant correlation to the airport, to the highways, proximity to highways. There is no significant pattern in even the hours of the day or like seasonal cycles. It's not related to temperature. Our best guess at this point is that it has to do with low quality housing. So for example, if plaster starts to disintegrate, if you have old paint in the house, there's a lot of smaller particles that tend to come into the air and mold and other issues. So that's our, that's the, that's the interpretation that is best supported by data right now. There might be other aspects that enhance this effect locally for certain households. So for example, one of the households is next to a smoke shop that doesn't tend to help indoor air quality. So there are sort of these individual stories, but I think the bigger story that has emerged from that is low quality housing is a concern. And in surprisingly, we've also done um, a remote sensing machine learning algorithm that looks for, tries to identify low quality housing here in the county. And it's surprisingly widespread. It's not necessarily limited to low income house communities. It's actually well into the intermediate income regime. So some of the really rich areas have less of it, but it's, it's quite commonplace. Um, given that from a satellite, I can only really identify rather extreme low quality housing as in roof problems, for example. So we don't necessarily pick up on the smaller aspects. So to come back to your question on toxicity, we have a project in which we would like to monitor water that is currently under approval. So we haven't started that yet. Our pilot results suggest that the water quality, the drinking water quality coming out of the tab is quite uh, satisfactory. So the toxicity that comes from the groundwater might not be as like might not be reflected in drinking water, but it could very well be reflected, for example, in gardens or if I grow fruit or food in the garden and I get toxicity coming into the food that way. So that's an issue that we found in other urban areas. Real, real quick follow Jenny? up on this. Sorry. Um, the, what is Director that? Eisenberg, would it, uh, I just wanted to maybe um, provide oh. a little bit more specificity on, um, this is Tess Spiler with the JPA. Oh. So first on to your question on how, how did we adapt um, the, the oh, project's findings to the REACH2 project. And we have revised some of the designs to accommodate the findings, raising some of the flood walls in areas so that it uh, so that we no longer see breakouts. And then your second question related to rising groundwater, it's a different project with the JPA, but the Safer Bay project will address emergent groundwater as well as the um, groundwater contamination in the area as part of that project. Well, thank you. Let me just close the loop on why I think this is related to the JPA. Um, so in the context of what I'm hearing, um, you know, the professor speak of the increased toxicity um, is the, the, the fact is, is that a flood that takes out as floods often do that maybe just, you know, disrupt the plumbing systems, the water systems that can flood the homes. When you have this level of toxicity in the homes, a flood can cause far more damage to the community and to na the natural environment than um, if with, without that level of toxicity. For that reason, I mean, to me, it seems like it's definitely within our mission. And maybe I would even argue really and as something we should really prioritize to ensure that these higher toxic areas are, are the most protected by floods. And I'm not, you know, 
personally, my bias has really been in favor based on my reading, more in favor of the nature-based solutions to, um, to, uh, about flood mitigation because raising a wall that could, you know, using more concrete, that can actually increase the toxic, toxic problems, increase the concrete, you know, that leads to the bad air, that leads to the, you know, all the toxins that, that this community is already suffering, but rather to invest in, you know, in, in the regeneration of ecosystem. You know, because we know that 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 lower income neighborhoods, one of the reasons for all this toxicity is often because they their natural environment has been gutted. And so access to nature is is unfairly unjustly distributed. And that definitely is a situation in East Palo Alto and, you know, many communities of color. You know, we it's like with it, it, it. It, it's on so many levels, it's inequitable. We need to ensure that people, despite income, race, and other factors, have access to nature. You know, so I'm not, I'm not too thrilled by the solution being heightening walls. I would like to see more investment in, in you know, in, in, in regeneration of ecosystem. And last quick thing, too, about the sediment release. It's interesting, from the valley water point of view, you know, whom I represent, you know, slow moving water, water that's still water is actually really bad for water quality. It really increases our costs and increases the JPA's cost too because of all the problems it caused. So, you know, what's called sediment release, I think is also maybe from my perspective, enabling water to move again. Moving water, I think, from at least Valley Water's point of view, from the environmental point of view for which I speak, you know, it's generally better than stagnant water. Right. So, you know, so I guess, so I guess my way is I do think this is an urgent issue based on the harm that could result from flooding in these lower income, highly toxic neighborhoods. And my heart is breaking for the families that live there to think the kind of air quality that they, they their babies are subject to is just, it's just not right. Um, I hope that to the extent we can help them, I hope we do. Yeah. Can I briefly comment on this nature-based idea? So um, I think it, there's a lot of power and wisdom in that, right? And I think we can all agree on that. I think one challenge of implementing that in a very dense urban setting is just sort of the, a certain lack of space, right? Like, so particularly in the reaches of the river where we project part of this flood risk increase, there isn't a lot of space and the banks are already sort of caving in in certain locations. So, so some of the roads are actually, I think, in, in themselves quite quite risky where they are located right now. So I think I, I love the idea in principle. I do wonder whether we need to, whether it would be useful to consider um, where that is possible to implement and how to do that. So for example, upstream, there is much more space. So maybe that, that would be an opportunity. But I think in terms of planning adaptively and what we're trying to, th what we're trying to achieve together with the JPA is to kind of come up with a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And I personally think that the best way to mitigate some of this flood risk I think I think increasing the the flood walls in some of these locations that that GPA is is currently proposing, which I think is a great idea personally, just because it it takes off the pressure for these households that are right next to the river, um, that that I think is valuable. And a lot of them are like about a third of them are rent burdened, and a lot of them are close to the poverty limit. So I think they need an immediate an immediate support. But I think also maybe talking about more nature-based approaches upstream. So the best way to solve this problem would be to mitigate the fluxes that actually make it into the urban segment of the river. So try to either have a floodable space there. And I know there's been discussions with Stanford and that's always a bit contentious, but I think that in my opinion would be a way to try to leverage nature and maybe, you know, like there are certain park areas or something that, that could be flooded intentionally and take the pressure off upstream before all of the water is in the river. Because um, yeah. once it's in that segment that is so densely populated, 
it's kind of, I think the, the options are just limited. And I, I think the JPA has done a really good job creatively approaching what the options are in, in that space. And also um, it, it flew by maybe quite quickly, but the flood risk in some of the marshland actually increases intentionally, right? Like that's where we want the flooding. That's where we can, we can you know, replenish the sediment base and the nutrient base. And, and so that's desirable flooding. So I think coming up with sort of different plans of like, Yes, we maybe need to increase some of these levies or, you know, like bank treatments, I think, just to make sure that these communities that have suffered a lot don't suffer more um, unnecessarily, but also complement that with thinking about how can we nourish the marsh. So there is a nature based component to this project, but also think about what can we do upstream to make sure that we don't have enough like that much water flooding into the urban segment of the river. Thank you. Thank you for that. And if there's anything Valley Water can do, I don't know if you're working with Valley Water. I, I encourage you to contact me and see how we can work together to yeah. for everyone's benefit. Cool. Thanks. I I would just make um, uh, I have one question, but would make a comment along those lines is uh, upstream as you get into obviously um, portions of of the creek where there is uh, more space. It's interesting that you're dealing with one landowner <laughs> on both sides, um, um, and that landowner being Stanford, um, the university you're at, um, has um, not always been amenable uh, to, uh, to to um, uh, some of what you think <laughs> is a way we should we should approach the um, uh, the issues before us. One question I had, uh, though, about your analysis as we look at this idea of sort of transferring risk, like, right, I think especially from higher income to lower income areas, it, it seems to me a really sort of clear analysis when you're looking at at sort of uh, some sort of waterway or creek and, and one segment of it on both sides is one grouping of household incomes. And as you move to another segment of it on both sides, there is another grouping of household mm -hmm. incomes. What's sort of unique about um, this creek is that those different household income segments um, are separated by the creek itself. Right. Yeah. And so in theory, if you're, cause I was looking at your dots. And so one side of that is, is East Palo Alto. And we've, we've talking a lot about the concerns there, but on the other side of that is, you, you, you know, Palo Alto, which is very not low income, shall we say. And so how does your analysis factor into that, that it's, it's not like, you, you know, we're, we're shifting from one area to another area where right. on both sides, we, we are surrounded by the same household income levels. Right, that's an excellent question. So maybe to briefly comment on the Stanford side of this debate. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm not asking you to, to be fair, I'm not asking <laughs> you to represent, but I had to make the comment. You know, like I, I appreciate that. And I think it's an important comment to make, right? Like, so I, I work in risk and often I don't necessarily carry a popular message, right? Like, so I'm kind of used to that. I do think we often run up against hesitation around certain issues, right? Like we all like, the success stories of like, we're doing great, there's no problem, right? Like, but I think we're dealing in the world of like, let's try to think about the problems before they happen, right? So I think one thing that I found in several of our projects is when you come with very specific quantitative analysis and saying, if you don't do this, then these are the consequences for these kinds of households. This is the lived reality of these households. This is what they're already suffering from. Is that, do you wanna tell me loud and clear into my face that you don't care about this? <laughs> so I think there is like presenting evidence can change minds that are might not be necessarily amenable to the idea without that evidence. So at least that's sort of, that's something we found in the past. Regarding the question of the two sides, it's a tricky one, right? Like, so in our, in our analysis, when you just look at the HECRAS model, the sides are actually symmetric for most places, right? Like they don't, they kind of have, like we are just taking the HECRAS model, we're not modifying it in any way. And we're just, and from the HECRAS point of view, because the symmetry, because of the symmetry, you would see equal outflow on both sides. Right. So like typically when you have a flood initiating in a location, the flow would go out on both sides. So both sides would be affected, but you still have this transfer, right? Like so from, from high income to low income, just because of how household income varies in, in the downstream direction. 
there is a subtlety there that I think at some point would be worth talking about, which is that the quality of the banks isn't necessarily the same on both sides. So one of the things that's amazing about San Francisco Quito Creek, it is a more natural riverbed than the vast majority of other Californian rivers, right? And there is a great value in that from an ecosystem point of view, from uh, you know, like a ecosystem diversity point of view and, and sediment transport point of view. There is a risk in there is a risk that higher fluxes, which we expect, could destabilize some of the banks, right? So that you could have some of the banks sliding into the river. And some of that in certain locations happened this winter um, where there was a bit of flooding. We don't currently have that represented in our model because we intentionally wanted to stick with the model that was the basis of all planning and just kind of say, if you have this model, what we're providing is this pretty simple probabilistic AI-based wrapper to just kind of look a little bit more broadly at risk rather than for one event. But there is this issue of, there is, this issue of the banks not necessarily being as stable as we would like them to be. And that entails a risk. It also entails a benefit. And I think we need to talk about how do we weigh these things. Cool, thank you. Thank you very much for the response. Um, any additional questions for the doctor? Yeah. I have another question. If no one else is, which group did you want yeah, to yeah. Yeah. First, thank you for the presentation. It was really, I think, some compelling data that you presented and alarming at, at times. And you kind of, I think you kind of answered this maybe maybe in part, but I mean, we're already well along in kind of our 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 plan for creek widening at, at times. And I think any of our goal is to move the flooding around, but looks like that may be a natural consequence of this at this point in kind of where we are at, what can, what can be done to mitigate those risks as much as possible? Great question. And I think JPA has already started that, right? Like, so they've already revised plans um, regarding the uh, top of bank treatments. And I think that's great. I really appreciate, you know, having our voice heard and, you know, acted on so promptly. So that's amazing. I think in addition to that, I think it would be useful to continue the, the debates about the upstream side of the story, right? Just because ultimately, I think that's where I see the best opportunity to try to avoid some of these issues emerging. And I think that's, maybe there will be an upstream of upstream project at some point, otherwise called the Searsville Dam project that would need to think about that. But I think that's, so for example, um, attenuating peak flows at the dam level, I think would be a worthwhile discussion to have because once you have so much water in the urban area that the creek gets overwhelmed I think it's hard to avoid flooding. I know there have been some debates in the GPA about channels and, and flow, you know, like flow features that could be constructed to get that water out of there, but um, that's gonna be very, very costly and hard to implement. So I think less realistic maybe. What I also wanna point out is that I think it's really important to update the infrastructure at San Francisco to Creek, right? Like I think overall, I think it's very important for this project to move forward, um, but I think, a few minor just like a few minor adjustments would make it more equitable um, and and more successful um, than than it was in in the original conceptualization. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and hope staff is listening and planning on reaching out too to be able to continue that collaboration and see how best we can mitigate the transfer of those consequences. Great, thank you. Thank you. Director Stone actually asked my question. Sometimes it happens, but I have a quick comment too. I, thinking about, because um, I, I, everything you're saying makes complete sense. And I'm very grateful to Ms. Byers who spoke your test, you know, saying that. So I'm happy to hear that y'all are working together. And I know that none of us want to slow down this project. Letting the community know we're not slowing down this project. We right. know it's so important. We're keeping it on track. Just had to put that out there. Sure. Um, you know, I guess my, my kind of comment about entities like Stanford is that 
I'd love to believe that presenting the negative consequence of, you know, actions on the more vulnerable communities would be enough to move them. But my experience is often that they have, they have um, obligations, you know, either the shareholders, the, you know, the investors, I guess this is, a, is whatever the equivalent of that is with the university, the overseers, they have certain, they will often say their hands are tied. I'm so sorry about the toxic waste this creates, but our hands are tied because our obligation is towards X, Y, and Z. So I don't really, you know, that's been my experience and my observation in doing these types of negotiations. That said, I think that it is possible to show Stanford and maybe other entities what is what they can stand to benefit mm -hmm. from these improvements. Because, you know, I mean, when we meet and you meet with Valley Water, we can come up with a long list of those things. Because I do think that ensuring the safety of our most vulnerable communities does benefit all of us. It really does. I mean, but sometimes that can be difficult to articulate to those who aren't, maybe don't have as much experience thinking that way. But anyway, so Greer asked my question, but I mostly wanted to just show my gratitude and reassure the public we are not slowing this down. We all agree this needs to happen and we will just make minor adjustments on the way. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sobel, thank you very much for, for the presentation. We really appreciate the, the time to present to us and your engagement um, up to this point with, with staff. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, with that, we'll close this agenda item. And then again, like I said, move um, back to our 5.5 our, our agenda item and, and open, up pub for the, uh, open up public comment to make sure um, that anyone who wants to provide public comment on that agenda item has the opportunity to do so. And, and a, a reminder that I, uh, item was the selection of a labor negotiator um, in connection with um, uh, contract negotiations, uh, employment contract negotiations with the executive director. And so, um, do we have any <clears throat> requests for public comment on agenda item 5.5, the labor negotiations? No requests to speak at this time. All right, th thank you. Um, and I also, before going on into a closed session item, uh, wanted to uh, make the announcement that I didn't, uh, but we heard her voice test by her is joining us remotely and serving as, as acting executive director for, for this meeting and in the absence of, of, of Ms. Bruce. And so I apologize I didn't make that, um, uh, that uh, introduction in the beginning. And so test just came on as a voice of God and maybe through, through, through some people, which maybe is not far from the truth. But I uh, thank you, uh, Tess, for, for, for joining us. I, I know it was a last minute ask and we very much appreciate you making it a priority to be here. Um, okay, so with that, we'll, we'll move uh, on to six, um, our closed session items, and I will call for public comment um, on, on these items first, the 6A public employee performance evaluation um, uh, regarding the executive director, and, and then 6B conference with labor negotiator um, uh, uh, agency designated representative. As I said, we're, we're going to um, uh, nix out uh, Director Abrika and put uh, Director Eisenberg and um, and Director uh, Combs in, in, in that place. And, and given that the uh, executive director is not present, that you know, negotiation won't actually happen today. And so I just want to be uh, clear about that. But I, I'll open up uh, a public, uh, public comment for, for, these, uh, for these items. Would any member of the public like to make a comment on agenda item 6A or 6B at this time? I have no request to speak at this time. Okay. Oh, thank you, Ms. Harris. Okay, so now we'll move into to closed session, um, and, but we, we will return. We, we have other open session items after a closed session. Um, and so do, do we have an estimated time of closed session or is that maybe something that I should an, answer more than, <laughs> more than you? We, we will try to make it as quick, <laughs> as, as short as, as possible, but we will be coming back for additional open session items. So with that, we will adjourn to closed session. All right. I'll call back to order into open session, uh, the May 25th, 2023 uh, meeting of the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority. And so um, um, uh, coming out from closed session, there are no reportable actions. Um, and so we'll move on to agenda um, item seven. 
um, or there are several action items. Uh, can you remind me, Ms. Harris, do we take public comment on all of them or just writ large? Okay, okay, so, totally cool. Okay, so let's start off with uh, um, agenda item 7A, review and consider adopting the proposal, the pr proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 um, SFCJPA uh, operations budget. Um, is there a staff report presentation, uh, a verbal staff report or presentation on, on, on this? Forgive us while we get our uh, board slides back up for the public. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so the executive director has shared the proposed budget with the members of the finance committee and has uh, used that input to refine it and uh, create the document that you see today. So the uh, budget that was included in the board packet is uh, for the board for consideration for next fiscal year. We might just add that the finance committee met on this budget and um, and commented on this budget. Oh, thanks. Um, okay, well then, um, any clarifying questions from the dais regarding the budget? Okay. Seeing none, let's open up public comment um, for agenda item 7A. Would any member of the public like to make a comment on agenda item 7A, fiscal year 2023-2024 draft operational budget? I have no request to speak at this time. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Harrison. So um, then I'll bring it back up to the dais for a, a discussion um, um, or, or, or a motion on, on on approving uh, or adopting the proposed budget. I'll move that we adopt the proposed budget. Second. All right, All right. we have a motion um, from Director Pine to adopt the proposed budget and a second from Director Eisenberg. I will now conduct a roll call vote. Um, Director Pine? Yes. Director Stone? Yes. Uh, Director Combs is yes. Uh, Director Eisenberg? Yes. Okay, uh, let it reflect that the four present board members uh, all voted to adopt the proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 fiscal budget. Okay. With that, we'll go on to action item 7B, review and consider adopting resolution 2305-25A to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute an amendment to the master services agreement, MSA, for HDR Inc. pertaining to HDR's consulting services in support of the Safer Bay project. Um, with that, um, are, are there any, any from the, the, the board, any clarifying questions on, um, agenda item 7B? All right. Seeing uh, none, let's uh, open up uh, public comment on this item. Do we have any requests for public comment to speak at this time on agenda item 7B, review and consider adopting resolution 230525A to amend the master service agreement for HDR Inc pertaining to HDR's consulting services in support of the Safer Bay project and authorize the executive director to negotiate the amendment. I have no request to speak at this time. Very cool. And just to clarify, there was no uh, verbal staff presentation on this. It was it was all, all, all written in the, in the packet, correct? Cool. All right, bringing it back to the dais, is there any uh, discussion on, on this item or, or a motion? Okay. Seeing, I will move that we um, we um, uh, approve um, or we adopt resolution twenty three zero five twenty five a um, authorizing the executive director to negotiate and execute an amendment to the master agreement with uh, for HCR Inc. Uh, is there a second? Second. All right. So um, uh, a first from from me, Director Combs. A second from Director Stone. I'll now conduct a roll call vote. Uh, Director Pine. Yes. Director Stone. Yes. Director Combs is a yes. Director Eisenberg. Yes. All right. Let it reflect that um, the board voted for zero um, to approve or adopt uh, uh, agenda item uh, 7B. All right. Moving on to 7C. Review and consider adopting resolution 230525B to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute amended task order number four to the master service 
agreement pertaining to ACR services for Safer Bay project. Any clarifying questions from the board? All right, seeing none, I'll open it up to public comment. Do we have any requests to speak on agenda item 7C, review and consider adopting resolution 230525B, amending HDR task order number four, TO4, pertaining to HDR services for the Safer Bay project and authorize the executive director to negotiate the amendment? I have no request to speak at this time. All right, thank you. So uh, bringing it back to the dais, um, is there any additional board discussion to be had or a motion on, on this item? I'll move to I'll move the staff recommendation to adopt the resolution and authorize the executive director to negotiate the amendment. Second. Right. We've got a, a first uh, from uh, D Director uh, Stone and a, a, a second from Director Eisenberg. So now we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Director Pine. Yes. Director Stone. Yes. Director Combs is a yes. Director Eisenberg. Yes. Okay. Um, with that, uh, agenda item uh, 7C is, is approved and adopted. All right, we'll move on to um, uh, agenda item 7D, review and consider adopting resolution 230525C to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract amendment with Environmental Science Associates, ESA, for reach to permit support. Um, I'll bring it to the board to see if there are any clarifying questions. All right, seeing none, let's go to public comment. Do we have a request for public comment? Anyone would like to speak on agenda item 7D, review and consider adopting resolution 230525C to amend Environmental Science Associates ESA Inc.'s contract scope of work to include additional environmental permitting support to expedite reach to permit finalization and authorize the executive director to negotiate the amendment. I have no request to speak at this time. All right, thank you. Um, Clerk Harris, so we'll bring it back to the dais for uh, a motion or any, any discussion. Approval. All right. Uh, second. All right, we have a first uh, from Director Pine and a second from uh, Director Eisenberg. So I'll now conduct a roll call vote. Uh, Director Pine. Yes. Director Stone. Yes. Uh, Director Combs is a yes. Director Eisenberg. Yes. All right, so um, 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 agenda item 7D is, is approved and, and adopted. All right. With that, we'll move on to um, agenda item 8A, executive director's report. And so um, I know that this, this report is, is written and so there isn't gonna be a, a verbal or in-meeting uh, presentation uh, on this. And so um, uh, I'll first ask the dais, is there, are, are there any clarifying questions to the, um, to the report? Okay. All right, seeing none, let's open it up for public comment. Or what did I, did I, did I miss something or no? Okay, no worries. So, so we're, we're going to do public comment on the executive director's report. Do we have any requests for public comment on agenda item 8A, executive director's report? I have no request to speak at this time. All right, thank you. And I know, Ms. Harris, when you, at the last meeting, you said, should I call for public comment or do you call for public comment? <laughs> and I said, I'll call for public comment. And I know that like this whole meeting, I've gone to you it's to, okay. to uh, call it's, for public comment. So okay. I, <laughs> I apologize. I'll get it straight eventually. I'm sorry. It's just fine. Um, I would like to make a staff comment though. Sure. Um, encourage anyone who has not submitted their form 700 to the JPA to please do so. Can okay. you let me know if it's not submitted? I'll send an email, if, okay? Thank you. Right. And for those watching at home, that's the financial disclosure <laughs> form that um, we as public officials have, have to submit. Um, okay, so uh, so we've called for a, a public comment on the executive director's report. Um, and and so I'll, I'll bring it, there isn't, there doesn't need to be any action from the board on this agenda item. And so I'll just bring it back and, and ask if there's any additional discussion to, to be had. Um, all right. Seeing none, we move on to uh, agenda item nine, uh, board member announcements, informational items, and requests. This is all informational only. Um, are there any um, uh, informational items from any member of the board? All right. Well, seeing none, then I think we'll go on to uh, agenda item 10, which is uh, adjournment. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. All right.